We would like to welcome you to a very, very special session. I am just so thrilled to have Dr. Jim Richards and Pat Richards, brother and sister. They're going to talk today about reconciliation of a broken hearts and relationship in our families. How many of us struggle with this particular area? How many of us search for the tools and ways how to talk to the people we love, we grew up with, but we just don't know how. So I have with me Dr. Jim Richards. He is best-selling author, teacher, theologian, and businessman. His success in these arenas has placed him in demand as a speaker and personal advisor to business, clergy, and political leaders. His personal process of emerging from years of pain, dysfunction, and deep bitterness has given him proven for tools for success in life, ministry, and business. He is founder and creator of Heart Physics Program that heals millions of people all over the world. He is pastor and leader of Impact Ministries. Pat Richards, my next dear guest, his sister, his older sisters, I'm going to let her talk more, heart physics. Because this program has affected her life, she became also one of our coaches of heart physics for Impact Ministries about seven years ago. And at this point, she has helped thousands of people learn to use Dr. Jim's teachings and programs to transform their lives. It is a beautiful journey that she hopes that you and I will join. So Pat, maybe we will start with you. I'd like to hear, would you tell us, how was it to grow up at your family, at your home? Well, let me start with one of my very earliest memories. I, I remember when they brought him home from hospital, and we lived in what we called a, a shotgun house. Oh. Just three straight rooms that you could shoot uh, they used to say you could shoot in the front door and the bullet would fly out the back door <laughs> and, uh, and i remember when they brought jim home from the hospital and uh, i actually thought that they brought him home just for me and i've often said that uh, uh how that translated into his life was that's just one more bossy woman i gotta get away from <laughs> You know, let, let me say this before she goes much further. I, I really do want to make this point. You know, in the 50s in, in, South, in the South, it was a very chauvinistic environment. And, uh, and, and women, you know, were not really held in, in the kind of regard that they should have. But one of the things that I realized in, in my life, you know, when, when I gave my life to the Lord and began walking with God. You know, when I look back, the greatest influence in my life were all women. You know, my, my mother influenced and, and, and mom didn't, mom, mom didn't necessarily try to teach us stuff. You know, she was just a woman trying to survive a bad marriage, poverty, you know, all that we went through. And, uh, but she was not a whiner. She was not a complainer. And, and so, you know, what she modeled to us was, you know, you, you can always make it. You can always make it through. You know, she, she didn't tell us that per se, but it didn't matter how bad things got. You know, she was, she was just kind of, we will always find a way. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. So, you know, my mom kind of gave me that, that kind of, of attitude. And um, so when I was, when Pat started to school, uh, which was 18 years before I did. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, back up. Oh. Typical baby boy, younger brother. Maybe I, mis maybe I miscalculated that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but no, when, um, when Pat started school, she would come home and she would play teacher with me and she'd teach me what she learned in school. And I can remember sitting there and we had a blackboard of some sorts and so so bef before my first day of school she had taught me how to read how to add how to subtract how to multiply how to divide how to print how to write cursive 
And so the, the one of the great influences that she, that she brought into my life was that learning that I could learn. And, and in our environment, that was not really necessarily a given. You know, a lot of times you just think that's a given, you know, you know, kids are just going to grow up thinking they can learn. No, not in the 1950s. You just, you know, you grew up and sometimes your highest hope was that you w would just survive. And, and then the, the, the one male influence in my life that, was was my uncle Bobby and and the thing where where what Pat taught me and what Bobby's influence was and what he taught me where it really merged together was that he would never allow me to and so I lived with him and my grandmother when when I was too young to go to school and so that you know she was the crazy influence in my life and he was he was a good influence in my life but uh, if I ever said I couldn't do something sometimes he'd wash my mouth out with soap. You'd say like, don't ever say you can't. You can say you don't know how. You can say you need to learn how, but you cannot say you can't. And so when you couple that with Pat's influence on teaching me uh, uh, that I could learn, th then it kind of came together and it shaped really my approach to not just to my life, but it, my shape, it shaped my approach to the gospel. Because because it's so like it doesn't matter what's in the Bible, doesn't matter what it says, I can learn it. I can I can I can do this. So so you know Pat was a great great influence in my life. And I, and, and even though I even though I really enjoy tormenting her, uh, uh, I, I really do. Uh, like enjoyed her. or you still enjoy? <laughs> I still enjoy. Uh, but but I but you know what? I want to give credit where credit's due. She she was a great influence in my life. Amen. So Pat, so how was it from your side? Well, from my side, it was very good. amazing. Uh, I was I was the oldest, and I was a girl. And as Jim said, uh, you know, there was not a high regard for women in general, and there was even less regard for little girls and women in our particular neighborhood. It was yeah. not a safe environment for me. There was there were a lot of things. I always, um, I, I rarely felt safe in our home. Um, mm -hmm. And really the grandmother <laughs> was, was the one place that I could go and be safe. That was the one place I could go and just be a little girl. She, I could go there and play with my toys and not have to look over my shoulder and wonder who was doing what or what was going on behind me or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, my, my growing up experience was quite different. And, uh, by the wait a minute, the same grandma that Dr. Jim tormented Dr. Jim as a little yes. boy, same grandma. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And she was, she was very peculiar. She, <laughs> you know, she, I, no, she's crazy. She wasn't <laughs> peculiar. She crazy. <laughs> I, I don't but, deny that, but I was her favorite child. She did. She did not like men. Yeah. Mm. And, so and why do you? Why could you say why she didn't like? I think I think that had a lot to do with her childhood yeah. and her growing up. She did not marry until she was a little bit later in life, and I'm sure for that time she was probably considered an old maid. And uh, she married our granddad, and he was a good bit older than her. Oh. And never successful. That was during, you know, they they went through some very hard times. Um, and uh, she, my mother, my mother was the oldest child in her family. So, the, and and then it was six years before she had a boy. And back then, the boys were the they they were the ones that worked on the farms and and. You know, and it was just, I think it was uh, I think a different time. I think it was uh, even more chauvinistic then than, than it was when I was growing yeah. up. And uh, and I think that probably men made her life very difficult. And, so uh, so you both suffered. You you grew up some in, in, in poverty and, and uh, alcoholism. Yeah. Now, did yeah. you have brother? Could you talk? Did you have more siblings? Yes, there was a, actually a brother between us. He he passed about fifteen years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he oddly enough, he was just kind of always the odd man out. You know, uh, my grandmother. I was the pet for my grandmother. Uncle Bobby, Jim was 
kind of his pet. So my mother and my mother set me down at the fairly early age. I don't remember exactly how, but she just explained to me the situation. She said, I know that y'all think that, that I, I pet him, but uh, this is just the way it is. He's got nobody and I'm going to be there for him. And, mm. and really at an early age, I understood that. I accepted that and understood that. Uh, I, I didn't understand. You know, by the time I was in the third grade, I was responsible for a brother in the second grade and responsible for a brother in the first grade, and uh, which created a lot of resentment because I was expected to be an adult. And, and of course, a little girl in the third grade, no matter how good she does, she's not going to be an adult. And, uh, and it was never quite as good as an adult could do it. And the other thing, the other thing was, if they got in trouble, I got in trouble, and they were always in trouble. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jim, is it true? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, our dad, our dad left, you know, well, even, even when our mom and dad were still married, he was almost never around. Never. So our mother had to work to support us, which meant we kind of raised ourselves. Mm. And so, you know, and we live, our house was on the edge of the woods. And so, you know, we didn't have money. We didn't have games that people have now. We didn't, we didn't have all the toys that people have now. So for us, entertainment was our imagination and what we could do running wild through these woods. And, uh, and then, and then really for my brother, I don't think Pat was ever this way. My brother was more this way than I was, but you know, it got to, my brother kind of got into that poverty, pushed him into that mentality that said, if, if, if we, there's something I want that I can't get, I'll steal it. Hmm. And so our, our brother kind of became the criminal kid of the whole neighborhood. If anything, if anything came in missing, if anything got stolen, if anybody's tires got cut or anything, they just, they, they didn't even look for who did it. They just came to our house and, and blame my brother because he, it usually was him. And it usually was him. Yeah. Wow. Well, could yeah, you tell his name? His name. His well, his name was Lawrence. As an adult, we called him Larry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, and let me, let me say this. You know, later on, he did give his life to the Lord, and there was a there was an incredible transformation in him because he was just honest. Oh. I'm telling you, he was just one of the sorriest people I ever knew. He was an outlaw. He was if you was, if you had anything of value, you had to hide it. He'd steal it from you, and mm -hmm. and uh, so we did. We fought. Me and him fought. He always won because he's bigger than me. <laughs> but we fought every day. Wow. I I will never forget one time. I had this tiny little apartment. I had I had just become a Christian and had lived with Jim for a while. And uh, Sharon and I, my daughter and I, moved out. And I moved. The only thing I could afford was this tiny little efficiency apartment. And uh, I was working and I came home early one day from work for some reason, I don't remember why, but my whole tiny little apartment was filled with stolen TVs that he had. <laughs> Larry. I, I don't even know how he got into my apartment. How did he do? Somehow. <laughs> oh, he knew how. <laughs> he got into my apartment and he, he meant to he meant to have them all out before I got home from work. And uh, I got home several hours mm -hmm. later, and there's my apartment full of stolen TVs. Wow. So, wow. yeah, so, it, you know, it was just, it was always, the, he was. It was always crazy. So, so uh, you said, Pat, you didn't feel safe. I what was your understand. then what was your dominating if i may say emotion that you guys grew up in you three of you um you know i oddly enough there was a lot of fear but that was not my dominating emotion anger was mm -hmm. my dominating emotion i um uh, i really stayed angry at our mother for for a very long time i Thought, and I remember quite clearly thinking mm -hmm. through. My mother was a fearful woman. She had a lot of fear, and uh, 
uh, I can remember it probably somewhere between, between 10 and 12 years old, making the decision, I will never be as fearful as my mother. And even if I am, nobody will ever know it. Hmm. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, I was very angry about that. I thought she was the one that could have gotten us out of that. And, and of course, at 10 and 12 years old, you don't always understand uh, all of the dynamics behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, her, she worked very hard and barely could, uh, we barely survived. Um, she, she, the first job that I remember her having, she worked in a clothing store and she worked till six o'clock at night, which was the reason we, you know, we were out of school by the time, by two, two thirty in the afternoon. So we spent all, most all evening, uh, we spent by ourselves. And, um, uh, uh, that was for me, the dominating emotion was just anger, anger and resentment. And how to survive, right? How, to, how survive. to survive. Just how to survive. Mm -hmm. And I learned, uh, a, one of my survival techniques was I learned that I could impress adults and I could, I could talk to adults and, uh, impress them. Mm. And also I could talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that, um, particularly dirty old men didn't mess with you quite a lot because if they did not know what you were going to do, what you were going to say and how you were going to react. They picked on the little girls that were quiet, docile. And, mm. um, that was smart. Well, it was survival. I don't know where yes. that, I don't know how I learned that. I don't know where that came from, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I picked up on that quite early. But if you make a lot of noise, you talk a lot, you're real loud, you know, you put that hand on your hip and give them that look, he hesitated. And, uh. Yeah. So, so that was a you had to protect yourself because there was no father figure, correct? Right. That's right. That's Dr. Jen, right. how about your emotions? Could you talk? You talk a lot in your teachings, but I want you to tell people that perhaps go through a like situation like you in your childhood. You know the uh, the first really deep emotion that I ever had was murder. And I, I, I can remember, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't usually get this emotional when I think about this. I'm just kind of having some emotional flashbacks here. Right. You know, I remember these, this little house we lived in, it didn't have doors. You had curtains, you know, so you couldn't close a door and be isolated. So anything that happened in the house, you, you, you heard it. And so, you know, uh, we would we would sleep a lot of nights listening to our mother beg for her life. So I can remember when I was about, it started for me when I was about four years old. I would uh, I would hide behind one of those curtains, and I would think, now when my father stops beating her and goes to sleep, I'll sneak into the kitchen, I'll get a knife and cut his throat. That's that was my deepest driving feeling and thought, you know, you know, toward life. And actually, just before I got saved, I actually tracked him down and went to kill him. And uh, I'm glad I didn't. But uh, uh, so then, of course, in, in that kind of environment, then you're, you, you know, you have this rage going on inside of you. But then all of that is connected to fear because, uh, and like. So, so you're like Pat was saying, you, you, you have to find your way to survive. And, you know, it was different for her because of being a girl. She, she had to find her way to survive as a girl, keep them getting molested and, and that sort of thing. But uh, with, with our dad and with our stepdad, and particularly with our stepdad, there was always the threat of violence. There, there was always, you all, you walked on eggshells constantly. You just never knew when he was going to go into a rage and start beating our mother or, or one of us, you know, uh, he did, I don't think, Pat, I don't think he ever got, I don't think he never physically, you know, got on you. But the problem was Larry, my brother and I, we would, We would jump in these situations. We'd try to defend our mother. And so, you know, we were kids, 
you know, right. but I right. can, you know, first time he knocked me out, I was 11 years old and he was beating my mother in the front yard. And I went running out to try to defend her. And, you know, I don't even know what happened. I just woke up later, laying, laying in the grass. You know, at, he, you know, I was about, when I was probably about, I don't know, 12, one night he was beating my mother and my brother jumped on him and started stabbing him. And so then the next thing you know, we're all rolling down the hall fighting because now he's going to kill my brother. And so you just, in those kinds of environments, you are angry. You want to hurt and kill the person that's bringing all this pain into your family. You know you can't because they're more powerful than you are. They're stronger than you are. And so, so you, you find ways to medicate and uh, cover up the pain. You know, I, I started, you know, when I was jolly, I think when I was about 12 years old, there was a beer joint. That's what they called them back in the 50s. There was a beer joint in our town that was owned by a guy named Joe. Uh, what was his name, Pat? You remember? Joe Rico. Joe Rico. He was an Italian. They say he was connected to the mafia. I don't know if he was or not. But, but uh, at, you know, at 12, 13 years old, I would, uh, me and my buddy would go to Joe Rico's. We'd, I'd sneak out of the house at night, and, and we would go there and barely knock on the back door, you know, barely could even see over the back door. And we would, we would buy beer and go out in, a, in, in this train yard where there were box cars and sit out there and drink at you know, 12 years old because you wanted, I mean, you know, you didn't know that's why you were doing it, mm -hmm. but you just wanted to anesthetize and read the pain and calm the anger and, and you want and you want to be somewhere besides home. You never ever want it to be a home because home was never safe. It was right. it was always violence. It was always right. strife and that sort of thing. Right, right, right. Some some of the earliest memories I have of the three of us. We used to lay in my bed at night and plan how we would murder. Actually, both our dad and our stepdad. I can remember lots and lots of nights. Yeah particularly after uh, after a mother would have been beat really bad situation we that would that would be how we would pass that time is how we would lay there plan how how we would actually murder or both of them and uh, yes you do a lot of things when you're in that kind of situation you do whatever you can to block that pain to to block this, you know, to block as much of the situation right. as you can. Um, I had a pretty active fantasy life uh, where I daydreamed quite a lot about uh, a different kind of life. Uh, I was angry quite a lot. We all left home by the time we were 16, right. each one of us, uh, I married. Uh, the middle brother went into the service. He went into the military. Jim, I think, just ran away from home. I'm not exactly uh, Yeah, I was, four, I was 14. 14, yeah. Yeah, we, we were all, before we were 16, we were all gone. Mm -hmm. But even then, the, a lot of the violence didn't stop. My, my stepdad, there were a lot of times my stepdad would actually come to my house and, and he's, he's pulled a gun on me in my own home and because I didn't, I, because I didn't answer something the way he, I was disrespectful or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, the violence continued. And of course, as angry as I was and, uh, and just looking for escape, even though I vowed that I would never be fearful and, I'd, and nobody would ever know I was fearful and I would never let anybody treat me the way uh, my dad You've been treated my mom. Of course, I turned right around and went right into those very same situations. Right. That was a normal. That was the normal thing to me. I I had seen my dad with other women multiple multiple times even before he divorced our mother. I had uh, seen him yeah. beat her and rape yeah. her multiple times. By the time I was five or six years old, 
Uh, so all of that, I, I really didn't know. Well, what I thought, I knew that there were other people that didn't live that way. It's just that I did not think it was possible for me yeah. to have any other kind of life. I, I thought, my thought was you were born into a good home where people didn't do that or you you just were not and and back then every you know everybody talked about being born on the wrong side of the tracks that mm. was you know that was kind of how people phrased it we were the wrong side of the track kids everybody in town knew us as curly's kids those yeah. are curly kids so you know you can't expect much out of curly's kids I feel like that all three of us tried our best to live up to that reputation. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it, it was. Um, so three of you responded to it on your own, in your ways, Larry, Dr. Jim, and you, Pat. Now, where was your mom? How long was she with uh, her second husband? She was with him until he died with cancer. Uh, Oh, so she stayed with him after you moved out? She stayed, she stayed with him. With him. She, she told me that she was always afraid that if she left him, he would try to murder all of us. Oh, oh. And, and, and I very well would have tried. No, he would have. He, he would have tried. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But you yeah, know, after, after, mom, him. after mom got saved, her motive for being there adjusted. Yeah. And she, you know, and, and I think she told you this pattern. She told me, she, she said, if I leave him, she said, nobody's ever going to love him. Nobody's ever going to help him. And he's so mean, you know, you know, everybody be afraid of him. And she said, I, I she said, I've been with him this long. I'm going to stay in the hopes that he can come to know Jesus. And he did. Jim, you need to tell the story of how he came to know Jesus. Yes, please. Please. Uh, you know, um, I, uh, when my mother told me a reason for her, a reason for saying, you know, and again, keep in mind that, I, you know, if I hadn't got saved, I would have killed my father and my stepfather. You know, my brother Larry, he was the one that you knew what he was going to do. People never knew what I was going to do. I, I, man, my survival mechanism was being alone that that's how i survived and so so there was this world outside of me that you know like i said with my brother he knew you knew if he got mad at you he was gonna hurt you you you, you always knew that nobody ever knew what i was gonna do because and, and usually if i got even with somebody it was always on the slide nobody knew nobody knew i did it i never told anybody i did it you know, like I, I told people, I said, you know what? I don't mind confessing any of my sins, but some of the things that I did were so horrible and unkind and brutal that uh, I'll never talk about them. I'll never, never tell a soul about them. Not, not because of any reason other than I don't want to do anything to glorify that kind of life, you know, and to, and to bring those memories. So, so, you know, I, I learned how to survive alone. And so I carried this thing around inwardly and uh uh actually I, I went to i actually went to kill my, my, my dad and and i wasn't cold enough just to walk up to him and, you know yeah. cut his throat but i knew if i could push him into conflict then i could kill him and justify it and get by with it you know not go to prison and so he he knew i was there for dirty business and so he was smart. I mean, I spit in his face. I pushed him. I cussed him. I did everything to try to just to get him to react. And so, you know, me and my stepdad, we have had, had similar but not quite as extreme interactions with each other, you know, where he would come, he'd come and threaten to kill me. And I'd be like, let's do it. You know, let's go. Let's see. Let's see who comes out of this, you know. And, and I mean, we would get on the verge of it. And we would, you know, it would get pretty scary. And, and then somehow or another it would die down or something would happen. So I didn't, you know, I, up until I got saved, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm killing you. I'm, I, I'm, I'm killing both of you. Y'all gonna pay for what you did with my mama. So, you know, when I got saved, I mean, you know, my, my salvation experience, it was real. My sense of call to the ministry was real. <laughs> and I had to reconcile this deep motivation to murder. I, I had to, I, I had to do something. You had to deal with forgiveness, right? Oh yeah. Uh, 
And, and I, this sounds real hokey. I mean, I, people might think I'm trying to be spiritual. I'm not. I just thought, you know, if, if, if getting saved is when your old man dies, then the one way I can kill them and get by with it is to get them saved. And then everything, everything they were has got to die. So my mom told me that about staying with my stepdad. And mm -hmm. uh, I just, I just, in my prayer life, was like, was like, God, I don't know how this is going to work, but I am saying, I, I choose, I declare, he cannot die without knowing, without coming to Jesus. I'm not going to let it happen. I don't care what, I don't care what happens. I don't care if I can pull him out of a grave. He, I'm not going to die. And so, you know, I witnessed him over the years. You know, we all, we all talked to him about the Lord. We shared with him. We all, and we were, we're all kinder to him, you know, after we started walking with God, we were all kinder to him than he deserved. So when he got cancer, uh, man, I was like, God, I was like, God, now I know, I know he's going to die, but I'm, but I am not, he is not dying without Jesus because my mother's not going to pay this kind of price and, and nothing happened. So anyhow, the long story of it was he, uh, Right before he died, he went to the hospital and he, and he went into a coma. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just kind of the end was there. And um, so I, I went up to, my wife and I went up to visit him and, and, and be there with my mom. And, and so I don't even remember how it happened, but somehow or another it managed that everybody was out of the room with him. Except uh, uh, Jim, I think before the night before he went into the coma, coma if i'm remembering the story he started getting hysterical and they called you in the middle of the night to come up there okay i, I couldn't remember why yeah. yeah yeah so anyhow i get in the room with him alone and, and i had ministered to people in comas before my position was they can hear me so, yes know, yes some, some part of them can hear me absolutely so I just started talking to him just like i would if i was trying to lead anybody to jesus and I, and and uh and he started saying from this coma, he was still in this coma, he started saying, Jesus, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? And I said, what do you think Jesus is doing to you? He said, he's, tor he's tormenting me. He said, no, he's not. Your sin's torment. I mean, you know, so we have this big conversation where he's not even really conscious. And so finally, at some point, I can't even remember the, the exact details. Uh, you know, I, you know, I just commanded that he, that he wake up, you know what I mean? And, and he, so he, he opened his eyes. Wow. And so I shared, you know, the plan of salvation with him, prayed with him. Yeah. And I remember sitting there thinking, this guy is so mean. He is so horrible that nobody's going to believe this. They're going to just think, they're going to just think he was hallucinating and my mom's not going to have any peace. Nobody's going to really believe this. And so my prayer, I didn't want him to get healed because I thought, you know, it, 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 it with as wicked as he is, if he, yes. if he gets healed, I don't know how long he'll walk this out. So, so I thought, so I thought, I don't, I don't really want him to get healed. I want him to live. And, I, and in, in my mind, I don't know why I came to this figure. But I said, I said, you're going to live for two weeks and you're going to tell everybody what happened here. Wow. He goes back into a coma. I'm thinking, well, hope it works, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and, and you know, when you tell stories like this, people get this, yeah, idea, exactly. like you're well. Elijah the prophet and you're full of confidence. I'm like, oh, I have no idea what's going to happen here. <laughs> you know, I don't even know, I don't know what this took. I don't even know what you mean. Yeah, I really didn't know. I just, you know, you just do what you do. So anyhow, what was interesting is over the next two weeks, every time he would come out of that coma and he would, he would have moments of becoming lucid. And every time he would, he would say something like, I really did it. I really did it. I really gave my life to Jesus. He, he told my daughter one of those times, he told my daughter, he said, uh, he said, I was really afraid. I was really scared. Mm -hmm. He said, Jesus came and took my hand and took me across the Jordan. Wow. <laughs> I, I, had no idea that he even knew what the Jordan River represented, but that's that's what he told my daughter. And him and our aunt, my aunt would go up there and stay with him at night so my mom could sleep. Him and my aunt would sing these real old old gospel hymns. Mm. 
over all night long. They'd sit and sing those old gospel hymns. Which, which aunt was that? That was Aunt Dale. The, Are you serious? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Her, him and Aunt Dale would sit and sing those old mm -hmm. gospels. When I when I go up there, if she was still up there, you could see hear them singing down the hall. It was it was absolutely amazing what happened. Wow. It was through Jim. Jim was the first in our family to become a Christian. And and through Jim, I was the next one that got saved. He led me to the Lord. Hmm. Our, our brother. My mom was next then. Yeah, <laughs> mom was next. Mom. Right. I, I, yeah. I remember thinking the three of us one night was having dinner together. This was before I got saved and before mom got saved. The three of us was having dinner together one night. And Jim was talking about miracles and he was talking about speaking in tongues and he was talking about doing all this stuff. So Jim left and me and mom were standing there and mom was saying, no, I don't, I don't know about all that miracle stuff and all that. <laughs> and I said, mom, I don't even know about all the God stuff. <laughs> In the, but, but in the back of my mind, this, this is what I was thinking in the back of my mind. He's got something I don't know about. He's either got to give it up or I got to find it. One well, of, uh, <laughs> that's one it. Of those things got to happen. He's either, I've either got to have part of it or he got to mm -hmm. give it. He can't have something like that because I would just see his light, mm -hmm. his eyes light mm -hmm. up and his countenance just light up. I've never seen Jim like that. He'd always be very hard and you know hard facial features and 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 just was you know just was a mm -hmm. tough guy and here all of a sudden his eyes are just mm -hmm. you know bright and shiny and his face is just lighted up when he talks about this stuff and he's excited and you can see that he's loving life and mm -hmm. I, I I gotta have some of that one too long before I got some wow. <laughs> but then and then uh, eventually Larry got saved, my my dad and my stepdad got saved. And it was wow. I, I can't say that mm -hmm. I, that it would have happened any other mm -hmm. way, but just the way it happened. You That's know? amazing. Yeah. Uh, Pat, you told me that before you got saved, uh, you had a hard time. You were mad at your brothers. You didn't even talk to them for a while. And oh, could you talk about to... reconciliation? How did it, how did you? Well, we, we would go long months and not see each other. Uh, they would oh, yeah, just because we've been scattered. I mean, our whole lives we've been scattered. Yeah. You know? you know, All right, so it was a result of, uh-huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was just a result of, of our, of our, of the way we lived our life. I was, uh. I was a party girl. I drank and partied, and and uh, you know, and even when even when Jim got saved, uh, I remember a phone call that I had, and I said, "Oh, you know how Jim is. He's on today. He's off tomorrow. You know, this is not gonna last." So, <laughs> <laughs> one of those passing things yes. that, that you know that uh, got into, but. I always, for me, family, because I remembered having yes. an intact family. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very young, but I have those memories of having a mom and a dad and and us all being together. Jim probably. I, don't, I, I never had that. Yeah, he mm. never. So, because, and I think because I actually had the memories of having an intact family, that was something that I always desired. So no matter how far away we would get from each other or how long, uh, you know, the except I I would always if they didn't if they didn't contact me, I always kept in contact with them sooner or later. You know, I reached out to them because mm -hmm. it was just uh, it was important. It was important mm -hmm. to me and it was important to try to maintain the family relationship as as much as I could. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the ironies is that, you know, Pat was better to me than anybody in my family. Mm. Uh, she's better to me than my mom or my dad. She's better to me than my brother, you know. But the irony was us, or at least me, I don't, she'd have to, she could only speak for her side of it. I can only speak for my side of it. 
the dynamic of my survival mechanism made it harder for me to find peace with her, not because of anything I was mad about. Mm -hmm. It was because uh, it threatened how I survived. Mm -hmm. You know, when, 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 so our dad's gone, so uh, Pat and Larry are in school, and, and it, it might have even happened before they were in school. I can, you know, I can remember staying with my grandmother. I mean, I couldn't have been more than four years old. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it, probably just for financial reasons, my mom had to farm. You were probably that staying a lot. with her. Yeah, you were probably staying with her pretty much all the time by the time you were three. Yeah. So, you know, so, so I am disconnected totally mm -hmm. from my family. I didn't mean I didn't love them or didn't have, you know, I had the desire to see, them, but, but, but more and more and more, you know, at a very early age, uh, be, being disconnected became like, so my survival mechanism, my, my grandmother, she had, my grandmother was really angry at my mother. Some people have said it was because my grandfather really loved my mother. I don't know that. Mm. But he, did you hear some of that too, Pat? Well, she, uh, she would tell me stories about how uh, granddaddy would treat yeah. her mom. She yeah. would tell me stories about that. So, yeah. I'd say so, I think my, my grandmother despised her. Uh, because my grandmother was not, even at her best, she probably wasn't easy woman to love um her, it just it was just a different world it was a hard world back then. everything was hard i mean so, I, so yeah i'm not trying to make a lot of moral judgments about her i'm just saying all the factors combined i don't know that she would have ever been that easy to get along with or to love i, I don't think she would have yeah and so so she had this problem with my mom and uh so she worked really hard to convince me that my mom didn't love me. Mm. So she was trying to create a sense you don't belong. You're yeah. not accepted. You're not approved. Both. Yeah. So you're not loved. Mm -hmm. But you know, at some point, and I I don't know how or when, I started kind of morphing into this concept of okay, if that's how it is, that's how it is. Mm. And I just got to live with how it is. And I can remember really, really young, just thinking it really doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter if anybody loves me, it doesn't matter if anybody cares. This, this is just the world I'm in. No. So, but so, then you didn't have God yet. Oh no. And you were speaking those dialogues inside. How did you, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, and, and again, though, being alone mm -hmm. also meant living inside my own head and not letting other people ever, ever really see what was going on. You know, I was like, Pat, I was afraid, mm -hmm. but man, you would never know I was afraid. You never going, I would never let anybody see that, that weakness in me. You know, and when I was a kid, I really wasn't, I wasn't brutal like my brother, but you know, sometimes I would just do violent things. Mm -hmm just to kind of make this statement to people around me, like, you better leave me alone. You better stay away from me. Yeah. Now, I didn't, ground. I didn't portray it the way my brother did. He did it more. I, he wanted people to know he was mean. He wanted people to know that he was dangerous. He, he thrived on that. I just want to be left alone. That was his language, survival yeah. language. You are bought all of you. Survival. Yeah. Trying to, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I came back home to go to school, mm -hmm. It annoyed me that Pat wanted me to be connected to her. It was Pat. I, I found it because, because I can't survive if I let anybody get in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is the first time she's ever even heard me say this, by the way. Yeah, I've never heard him say this. I, it doesn't surprise me, but yeah, I've never heard him say. I this. mean, just it's just like nobody. Uh -huh. I mean, it, and it. I wasn't taking this to say I didn't love the people in my family, but it was like, you're going to stay kind of, everybody's going to stay at arm's distance yeah. because you know, my grandmother had already persuaded me that I really wasn't all that lovable. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then it's kind of reinforced 
by never being with your family. So, you know, I, man, I began I, I, at an early, early age. My, my inner life was, it did not include anybody. No, but nobody, nobody was included in my inner life, my dreams, my future. And the bad thing about that, I could, I could be incredibly loyal to people circumstantially, mm. but at the end of the day, if a person became an emotional liability, I could instantly cut them out of my life. Just, just with the decisions like, that's it. Mm -hmm. So those were thick walls that you built around yourself. And if someone had a slight potential to get through, you pushed them away. It was well, every, every relationship, every romantic relationship. Right. Anybody. As soon as it got too serious, too right. close or crossed some boundary, that was right. it. And, and it wasn't like, a, it wasn't like a, a progression right. to it ending. It was like, this is it. This is over. I'm done with this. Wow. So don't you think perhaps just a question subconsciously, even if person loved you, was good to you, you thought it has, but she's got potential to hurt me. I don't want that. No, no, exactly. I know nobody's going to get in. Okay. So Pat left when she left. I was, hmm, I was probably 12 or 13. 12 or 13, somewhere between 12 and 13. Oh, so young. And so, so she, she gets married and leaves. My brother and I are at home. We, we never, never see each other, never talk to each other. I don't, I don't think probably after Pat left home, I don't ever remember me and him ever having another civil conversation ever, ever after that. That's sad. And, uh, and so then I didn't really see my mother that much because every day I avoided being at home every way that I could because there was always this potential for violence if I was at home. So... Actually, I think I probably saw you more, you and Larry both more after I left home because my my house, my home kind of became a crash. Yeah. And there was nowhere else for them to go. Yeah. Crashed at my house. So Yeah, you know what? We 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 did. And the be probably the best connections in our whole life that I really felt was that that was a refuge I could go to. Yeah. I still wasn't gonna let that didn't mean I'm gonna let anybody inside. Yeah. Right. So when I was, uh, when I was actually, uh, uh, I, I made several runaway attempts when I was younger and just, and you know, I could, I, I'd climb out the window and, and me and my buddy would, would go jump a train or something like that. And, but we never could figure out how we were going to survive. So you didn't have any choice but to come back. And so when I was uh, uh, about 14, I, uh, I was in the eighth grade. And so I just, decided one day this is it i am disappearing and and this this became my ultimate i will keep you out of my life and keep you from hurting me i will just disappear from anybody anytime anything is it ready so i remember for you know writing notes to all of my teachers saying that we were moving and we weren't signing my mother's name to it and so that so, because i wanted to be able to get out of school yeah. and get out of town before, you know, before I get reported probation, I mean, a, a truant officer or anything like that. So I just wanted to, so I didn't want anybody looking for me. I wanted long enough to get out of town. Mm. So I, I, um, I, I got a paper sack, stuck me some clothes in it, and I hitchhiked to, to the town where my uncle lived. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, you know, looking back now, I know he had to call my mom, but I went over and I made up some BS story about, how that they were moving and, and they wanted me to finish the school year in the, you know, in the state of Tennessee and want to know, they want to know if I could stay there till the end of the year. And of course he let me and uh, I lived, I actually, I, I lived and slept in his basement mm. and uh, uh, which I wasn't bad. I was, I was happy for it. It was peaceful. There was no, there, there was no conflict. Right. Thank God for uncle Bobby. Oh man. I'm, Thank I'm God. So, yeah. you know, they, at the end of that school year, they made me come back home and I just came back, stayed a little while, ran away again. And then, so when I was 15, they, they tracked me down and, and, and they brought me back home. And they said, if, you know, if you don't stay, we're, we're put, we're going to send you to reform school. Mm -hmm. 
So I sat, man, I sat there, I convinced them, I convinced mm -hmm. them I was going to stay. I convinced right. them I was going to work it through, mm -hmm. I could, you know, da, 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 da. that night I ran away again. Oh. I was 15 by then. And so, so I never, never went back, never went back home. But you know, as far as with Pat and I, and it took me years to understand this. I was a baby that she took care of. So, and in her experience and in her memories, she had all of these great memories and she had this connection. And you know, you know, the more you do for somebody else, the more you connect to them. You know what I mean? And so she connected right. to me by taking care of me, mm -hmm. all, all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, I, I struggled with I struggled with, with two things. E even after I got saved, I had trouble letting people in. I mean, it, it took me a, a long time to work this to work this it, out. It, it didn't change for several years. Oh no, it didn't. It absolutely didn't. And and I knew it. I mean, I just didn't know how to get through it. I didn't. I, I, and my, my my here was my fear. My fear was this. I never. I was always afraid if. I let you get too close and whatever this switch is, that's in my head. If it flips, I don't know if I can ever come back. In other words, once I cut somebody out of my life, I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a way back. I, I don't know if I could, I can, I don't know if I can ever, and it's like, I'm not mad about anything. I'm not holding anything against you. I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, I'm not upset just about anything. Just I just don't know how to live with anybody in my life. Right. So, so it was difficult. Uh, and so on so many levels for Pat to express and, and not in bad ways not never it was never in a bad way but it was difficult for her to express this love and this connection and I'm like I'm sorry I, I'm like I don't I don't remember I don't remember any of that I don't you know I don't remember you taking care of me I don't you know it's like I wasn't there and and I believe you love me. I, I, you know, I always believe she loved me. I always believe she cared about me. It wasn't, it wasn't that. And like I say, it wasn't that she had ever done anything bad to me per se. I just didn't know how to let anybody in. And so we had this thing. And Pat, you tell me if I, I might be explaining this wrong. I'm just, all I can tell is from my, from my side and, or my experience. You know, I, I felt this almost intense pressure to own this relationship, this connection that was alive to her, but it wasn't to me. And it didn't, again, it didn't mean I didn't love her. And it didn't even mean I didn't want her, my, I didn't want to find a way to have her in my heart or in my life. That It just meant at the time I didn't, I couldn't. I, I You know, the, the, the person that, that broke into my shell was Brenda. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and, and of course, all of that that you were struggling with, although I didn't, I didn't understand it, or I, you know, but I felt it. Yeah. I always felt that, uh, that push away. Yeah. That, uh, and, and rejection, you yeah. know, it just, it just felt like rejection. And uh, although I knew that there were reasons for it, I didn't understand those reasons. Yep. And all, all I understood was that it just felt like rejection. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and there was a lot of pain with that. But at the same time, <laughs> which, you know, I, I, you had the desire to push away and I had the desire to push in. Yeah. Yeah. And there was no, and there was like no stopping either one of those things. Yeah. Until we, until we started dealing with the heart issues that were, yeah. that were actually connected with all of those issues. Yeah. Was, that was when, uh, uh, you, know, my life fell apart about fifteen years ago. My my entire life fell apart about fifteen years ago. And and every single relationship close intimate relationship that I had uh people left people died people moved away and and then Jim had a bad car wreck and I wasn't sure he was actually going to survive all that and uh but that was uh, about 15 years ago really was when I started 
really dealing with with my codependency, which was a huge factor and issue. Um, you know, I started dealing with um, my control issues. I started understanding <laughs> that I had control issues. Um, and I started understanding how they affected people around me. And, and Jim's, Jim pushing away uh, tr always triggered my control issues, hmm. you know, and, and I didn't. I believe every brother does that. I have four of them. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably, you know, but, I'm with you. Uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I walked into my kitchen one mm -hmm. night when I was, when I was trying to deal with all this, I had, I had so much mental and emotional pain. Mm -hmm. that every, every day that I woke up, I, I just, you know, I never, I never said what I would do. I just always said to God, I don't know what's got to change. I just know something's got to change because I cannot continue to live in this kind of pain. Mm. Uh, let, me, let me insert something here, if you don't care. Sure. She, she was married to a guy who is what I call, would call a closet controller. Yeah. And, and, and really about the time I started feeling my way into opening myself up a little bit to my extent to my brother and sister and you know this guy this guy was one of these guys he was really nice mm, very he nice. came across like he was not pushy but he was a controller and one of his goals was to to totally alienate me and pat from each other he did not want her having the type of connection. I mean, see, even, even with all this crap going on between us and with all this distance, we still both recognized a connection that was there. We didn't know what to do with it or how to make it work. And, and he did not want her having that connection to me. And so, so he kind of took her through a manipulative process to alienate her and, and get her really at a distance. This is such an important thing to recognize. So many families that will listen to you, they got to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. So right. go ahead, Pat. Right. I, you know, um, at the time, I didn't understand that. I did understand that it threatened him, our relationship, mine and your relationship threatened mm -hmm. I, I, I knew that, but I didn't understand. Even all of that, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why. And he was such a... I, I've always said that the, the ugliest thing I could say about him was he was such a nice guy. Only I don't say it that nice. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he, he, his big thing was he could not, everybody had to know what a nice guy he was. And if anything, if anything happened, it could not be because of him because right. after all, he was such a nice guy. So, yeah, so I had, gone through a divorce that I didn't see coming. Uh, my daughter had moved away quite suddenly, very suddenly, taking all my grandchildren uh, with her. My mom died. Our mom died. She, she died on a Wednesday. We buried her on a Saturday. This brother between us was dead by the next morning after we buried our mom. And uh, that was, I, I was at the oh. end of my emotional anything i i had nothing left oh my god i i was about as broken as you could get and still be up and moving um, actually it was quite difficult i was raising two foster boys and uh, which was a interesting challenge all on its own but that but i really it was those two boys that gave me a reason to get up mm -hmm. And keep moving and keep going and keep doing something and um, I started dealing that's when I started dealing with my codependency that's when I started dealing with my control issues that's when I started understanding I took Jim's uh, disc profile and it was the biggest shock of my life to see my personality I, I had no personality if you ask me a question I could not answer that question until I felt like I knew what 
you wanted me to say? What, what, what response did you want me to give? I couldn't, until I knew that, I couldn't answer a question about anything. I had no, I had, I didn't know what it was to dream for my own life. I didn't know what it was to have a vision for my own life. I didn't know what kind of person I wanted to be. Uh, I didn't know who I was, I, you know, I had no identity. Wow. I had absolutely no identity. And uh, God just, and, and Jim, I had been in a ministry of my own and had to give that up. And uh, I went to Jim, I said, Jim, I have got to work but I've got to be somewhere where people, if I don't show up for a day or two, somebody's going to come looking for me. Uh, can I come back to work for you at Impact? And Jim said, you can, but you have to promise I'm going to release this program called Heart Physics, and you've got to promise me that you'll do it. And and I say, I just lied. I, lied. I just lied. I told him, oh, yes, Jim, I'll do anything, whatever. And right. I I had, I'm thinking there is no way. I don't know what it is. Don't know what, what the heck is heart physics? What's it supposed to do? And then when I found out that it was putting the headphones on and listening to Jim for an hour a day, <laughs> I said, God, I've been listening to this boy since the day. <laughs> Look at the screwed up mess I'm in now. How is listening to him with headphones for an hour a day? <laughs> And take notes. <laughs> oh my gosh! You, I'm telling you, it's like God. This cannot be what you really want me to do. I, I, I cannot believe this is what you really want me to do. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, he. So so I started heart physics. It was the hardest thing that I ever tried to do in my life. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. after, at, by that time, uh, my adrenals were really getting sick because mm -hmm. of and all the heartache and all the emotional issues really beginning to be sick and I never slept past two o'clock in the morning if I went to bed at eight o'clock if I went to bed at 10 o'clock if I went to bed at 12 o'clock I was awake at two o'clock in the morning two two thirty and finally one night I said nothing can be worse than laying here at two o'clock in the morning thinking about if I had done this if I hadn't done this if this had not happened if that had not happened if you know, if, 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 I thought nothing can be worse than that. So heart physics cannot be this bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would put those headphones yes. on at two o'clock in the morning. And that's how, that's when I learned how to do mm -hmm. heart, but it was still very difficult for me. But mm -hmm. then things begin to happen inside me. Emotions begin to level off. I say I, I came back to sanity. I became a sane, semi-rational. I, I, I would say that <laughs> you might have become sane for the first time, the way I would say it. Well, yeah, that could, that could very well be, yeah. Uh, although I had, you know, I had seen moments in my Christian life when I, there was the possibility of me becoming sane. It, it just never happened, you know, mm -hmm. it just never happened. Uh, yeah, that's, and, and that's when my life began to change. That's when could, I began to change. You said you are a life, a heart physics coach. Could you say a little bit more about this just for people so they know what is that program? Just briefly. Uh, heart physics is a, is a meditation program. It just basically, basically it mm -hmm. teaches you how to get in touch with your own heart. Mm -hmm. And right. then you invite Jesus into that space with you. And you discover who you mm -hmm. yes. and you discover who God is mm -hmm. and you you begin to understand who he died mm -hmm. so that you could come. You you begin mm -hmm. to understand who that person who that person is. And it gives you hope. I had mm -hmm. never had hope that my life could be anything but the screwed up mess <laughs> was. I, I virtually was a person completely and utterly without any kind of hope. Mm -hmm. And and heart physics, heart physics didn't change me. It gave me hope mm -hmm. that that I could change, that things could be different, that my life could be different. Mm -hmm. and, and as I began to change, 
mine and Jim's relationship is one of the greatest things I think about this, this heart physics program is it teaches us how to communicate. It teaches us how to communicate with ourselves and be honest with ourselves about, about our, our deepest secrets. Uh, it teaches us how to be honest with God. And then it teaches us how to be truly honest without, without creating pain. Mm -hmm. you, can be on, you can be honest, brutally honest with somebody and you're doing more damage yes. than you're doing good. But it teaches us how to be honest without mm -hmm. pain. Mm -hmm. And so as my communication with myself and my communication with God began to change, I feel like that my communication with Jim could then be more and more honest. I could, right. when I needed to be back up, back up, when mm -hmm. I needed space, I could do that and not feel rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I needed that um, mm -hmm. connection, mm -hmm. he was open to that connection because I wasn't pushing, I wasn't pushing, I wasn't pushing, pushing, pushing. So I, I believe that it gave that relationship breathing space. And uh, I, you know, and, and we just, I began to be honest with him about mm. just situations about the grandmother. I probably told him for the very first time, you know, Jim, I know you had that feeling about the grandmother, but that was not the, that just was not the, that wasn't how it was for me. I, I don't right, think different opinions, different points. I, I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever really expressed mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so just gradually, gradually, mm -hmm. gradually, we opened our hearts to each other. We felt safer with each other. Mm -hmm. I had to push to make that connection. He didn't feel like he had to run away from that connection. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's what I, that's, so what I see, something that was missing in your life, safety, security. Now you have this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a couple of really interesting dynamics here. You know, and, and I don't know if Pat's ever verbalized this you know, to herself, but at the time that she was going through all this, you know, when you're, when you're a pastor, and, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I used to tell Brenda this all the time. It's like, I say, you know, you know, so Bob that used to sit on the front row. I said, you notice he's sitting on the second row now. And then, you know, a month later, it's like, you know, so Bob's sitting like on the third row now, you know, so Bob's on the back row now. And then all of a sudden Bob ain't here. And, and because what people, what people would do as a pastor, as a minister would be when they begin to get sin in their life, mm -hmm then they do two things. Number one, first, they start avoiding whoever the spiritual influence in their life is. And then the second thing is they start looking for faults. Now, one of the really interesting dynamics that uh, Pat, I'm sure you've thought about this, but actually, when all of this was blowing up in Pat's life, the real reason almost all of this was happening was because of people that had issues with me because of where they were going in their life. You know, like with her daughter, her, her daughter's husband did the same thing that Pat's husband did. He decided that, you know, I wasn't scared. I mean, it's like, I wasn't going around monitoring anybody, but he decided he wanted to kind of have a different kind of social life and, you know, be a social drinker. That's all right. I don't care. I mean, that's, that's fine. But he couldn't do that and have a connection with me. So he starts building this wedge between me and my niece, and which means him and him and Pat's daughter, my niece. Now now they start finding this pushing for this disconnect. Yes. Yeah. Well at the same time that happens, my brother's wife decides she's gonna lose her mind and go go new age. She starts pushing my brother for a disconnect from me because they, all these people went to our church. And, but, they, but then she also kind of probably very subtly, you know, became more critical of me and more critical of the ministry. And so, so really what ended up happening is ev almost everybody around Pat, other than our mother, was pushing her 
to break and distance relationships with me. Yeah. yeah, the whole family, the whole family came apart. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it honestly, I'm telling you, it was an undoing of our mom. It was the final, it was the final blow that pushed her over to that she couldn't physically. Oh. Oh. And uh, so, so, you know, and, and you know, you, you love these people, but you're watching them, watching their lives spiral out and there's nothing you can really do about it. You know what I mean? Right. They're going to go through what they go through and you, you know, you try to be there if they ever want to recover. So in the middle of this, then her, this, this husband that she's trying to find a way to appease, mm-hmm. you know, he, he sat down with me uh, like a pastor, you know, and I had one of the most irrational conversations about why he wanted to disconnect, you know, from me and our ministry. And it's like, that's fine. You know, if that's what you want to do, but you know, nothing you said is true, but if you want to disconnect, it's about disconnect. That's fine. But, but you don't have to, you don't have to start all the fault finding, but that's what people do. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know, Pat, if, if I'm sure at the time it was all so overwhelming. I don't even think you could have seen it. I, I want to tell you that was, that was the hardest time. Oh no. Of, of my entire life, actually with, even with all the childhood trauma, that actually was the hardest time of my life, my whole life. And then on top of all of that, that's when you had that bad car wreck. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh. and I was not sure that you were going to live. Oh. No, no but matter of fact, my family, I think at a point or two was told I wasn't going to live, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I really, it, it, to me, it is nothing but the grace of God that I am here, that mm-hmm. I'm able to be who I am. But and I and I tell people all the time, and it's the honest truth. Yep. You know, the very all everything that was used to try to destroy me, mm-hmm. to destroy my life, to try to destroy mine and Jim's relationship to try, try to destroy any opportunity, any thought of ever ministering, ever being anything that God ever wanted me to be. Today, I use all of that. Sure, absolutely. All of that to be an effective heart coach, to help people through whatever trauma. I don't care what kind of trauma you've been through. Some of it's touched my life. Yep. And, here, and here I am today. And uh, I may not always be in my right mind, but <laughs> but, I get, but on most days I get close. <laughs> and on those days I have Jim to you know to kind of correct me and bring me back. <laughs> Straight <you up. laughs> so, uh, At that time, Pat, here's a really interesting thing, and you didn't know this. See, during the time that she decided, mm-hmm. and, and she didn't do it really. It didn't have anything to do with me. It had to do with the, with the pressures that her husband and her child was putting on her to, to you know, to, to di- make this distance. You know, I mean, nobody ever said, let's make this distance. Everybody just yeah. said, you know, what? No, no. We, we, you know, we're tired of all this. He's, he's this, this, this. We need to go find. And, and, and you know, and there was nothing wrong with people. I, I don't have a problem. People won't go find whatever they're looking for. But, you know, what was interesting was that was a time when I was becoming more open to me and her having a relationship that I'd ever had been. Isn't that interesting? And, and so, you know, the potential was there for both of us yes. really to get worse because, mm-hmm. because she's got these pressures to, to distance. And so now I'm finally, I'm finally trying to figure out how to have a relationship with her. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so getting kind of, you know, pushed away. And so, but, but I'll tell you something, and Pat, uh, we haven't talked this through a lot. See, when, when, we, when people think about reconciling, they go to some goofy religious place that they've heard preachers tell them to go to, and they, yep. and they think that they've got to sit down and work everything out. You know, Pat and I have never sat down and worked anything out. This is the closest we've ever come to actually saying 
we're going to talk about all of this. So wait a minute. I set you down right now. This is the first time. <laughs> very first time. I understand the concept. I understand that. That's good. Is the mm -hmm. very thing that we tell people to do in heart physics. What we do is the very thing we tell people to do in counseling. Yes. You know, when a couple comes to see marriage counseling, for example, mm -hmm. I always yeah. tell people marriage counseling is the stupidest thing there is. <laughs> marriage counseling <laughs> never works. But you know, it's like two people are going to come to you and you're going to tell them what they need to do. Right. And like if they could do that, they'd already be doing it. They wouldn't be here. Didn't <laughs> you? you know, so, so you're going to well, tell people that, are so angry and so hurt that they can't, you know, they can't do what they're supposed to do. And you're going to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. I always tell people marriage counseling, oh, look, here's the deal. No such thing as marriage counseling. I, you know, I, I will work with you mm -hmm. and help you get whole. Yes. And I'll work with you and help you get whole. And if the two of you get whole, you'll be able to come together and have a relationship. That's it. And, and really you, it, it won't be much about the past at all. You know, so, you know, in your heart, you may have to f send away some things. So deal but with you. Know, you. Mm -hmm, Pat, mm -hmm. you know, Pat dealt with her stuff. Mm -hmm. I dealt with my stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what happened and now Pat, you correct this or you may add touches to this. I'm not seeing from my side, but you know, just what happened was it got safer and safer. Yeah. For us to be connected. Exactly. You know, so I, I when, when people see safety is such a big thing. I would you know, sometimes somebody comes come to me and they'll, they'll say, well, I don't know. I can't work out anything with my wife. And, and, I, and she won't tell me. I'm, I'm, I'm like, well, let me ask you something. How safe is this for her to tell you? If she tells you what the real problem is, how much mm -hmm. pressure are you going to put on? How long are you going to rant and rave and blame her and, and, and fight and carry on and act stupid? You know, I, I'm not, see, I, I'm a, yeah. I'm like a, a low maintenance life. It's like as complex as my life looks on the outside, my life is really, real simple. It's like, you know what? I'm going to be good, as good to you as I know how to be. But if you're high maintenance, I'll send you a Christmas card every now and then. <laughs> and that's the we're gonna get. Not that I'm going to reject you. And not that that's I want right. to be there for the people that, that I care about. Yeah. But it's like, here's the, see, the Bible says, here's what the Bible says about family. Nope, nobody believes this. The Bible says a neighbor nearby is better than a brother far away. And, and the real truth is we're going to have relationships with people that first and foremost have to be safe, not obligatory, not because of your bloodline. Is it safe? Can I go around this person and walk away and not be beat up, pressured, manipulated, or whatever? And so, so like I say, I, I, you know, I never, I mean, there was a lot of years there where I was hoping we would find our way, mm -hmm. but I never went and said, we got to find our way. We got to solve this problem. And she never came to me and said, we got to solve this problem because I didn't feel like, I felt like I just got to deal with my part of this. I, I can't, I can't, I can't deal with her part. Cause I do. I'll end up in judgment. I'll end up making you know, pressure on her. So Pat, so from your good. perspective. <laughs> So I, I, I totally agree. It was the safety part. You know, like I said, when I stopped con trying to control, when I stopped trying to push, you know, because I, I would feel the rejection from you and, and that would put yep. me a hyper drive to, you know, try to connect, try to connect, try to connect. And yet at the same time, I knew that wasn't working. I mean, mm. I feel that you just, you know, that. So, yeah, it was the safety call. I, because I learned how to communicate with my own heart safely without judging myself, without ripping myself apart. I invited God into that space with me. I learned to communicate with God in a completely different way. And then I could take that, that I had, that I had formulated in my own heart. I could take that out to other people. Mm -hmm. I was very hesitant about taking that out, but but yes, as we found out that we were safe with each other, you know, we had a little conversation here and a little conversation there, and each conversation we tested the waters a little bit more and were a little bit more honest about, you know, about relationship stuff. Uh, and, and of course, one of the things that I think uh, probably facilitated so much of this is the Facebook group that 
that we've been involved in. You know, I just determined that um, so many of those people had had exactly the same issues that I've dealt with. And the only way to help people is not to not to act like, oh, I've got it all together. I've always had it all together. You know, mm -hmm. no. people have got to see the process. They've, they've got to see how you got from A to B. You know, I didn't get from A to Z in one big, you know, one big thing. It, I walked it out. It was a journey. It's been a journey. It's still a journey. I love my journey. I love day getting up and, and knowing that there's something that I can learn, something new I can learn about myself, something new I can learn about God and something I can maybe help somebody else learn about themselves and learn how to apply all that and make life work. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done in my entire life. I love every minute of it. And we all thank you so much for creating this group, Dr. Jim. Thank oh, you, yes. Pat. It's, it's been one of the most amazing things I've ever been involved in. It's called Ultimate Impact. You know, you know an interesting thing, you know, the Hebrew word for... Um, for, for giving or for and, and or for sacrificing is actually two different words. And you know, the Hebrew word for giving is a continuum. It's a, it's what they call a polydrome. And, and it's spelled this, it, it's spelled frontwards and backwards the same way, which represents a continuum. And what you realize, of course, giving is the only thing that makes you capable of receiving. And so whatever it is you give away, you become capable of receiving. Well, you couple that with the word sacrifice. The word sacrifice is the word Corban in, in the Hebrew. It means draw near. Now with God, we are never trying to get God to draw near to us. When you, when you give anything, kindness, mercy, whatever, anything you give away, increases your sense of value for the person you're giving it to. It's like putting a price on somebody's life. I'm willing to give this for you. That's what God did for us in Jesus. I'm willing to give this for you. So God's heart became totally bound to us. I mean, it already was, really, but, but, but his giving bound his heart to us, even if our heart doesn't get bound to him. And so... Uh, you know, in, in one of the things that does happen as you, people tend to withhold kindness to one another. And sometimes it is that safety thing. I don't feel safe. I, you know, you know I, I, there's some people, if you're kind to them, they're going to take advantage of you. Yes. You know, and so, so you can't afford to be kind to them because you're opening the door to abuse, that sort of thing. And, you know, fortunately, you know, Pat absolutely never was ever in our whole life, you know, somebody that I had to fear taking advantage of me or that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, she found her ways to do things for me. And probably that has a lot to do with, you know, what she was giving as far as kindness and love and that sort of thing, probably kept her bound to me in those early days when I was not able to be bound to her. You know, when, when I couldn't, it wasn't that I didn't want it, wasn't that I didn't love her, wasn't that I didn't care. And wasn't that, I would have stepped up for her. I mean, I would have, I would have, I would have gone to the wall to protect her or anything like that. I but, always do that. Yeah, but it wasn't still emotionally wasn't the same. So, you know, she did whatever she did in whatever way she did it. And it kept her bound to me. And uh, I didn't plan this. And when I look back, you know, my life is full of, uh, you know, the, the Hebrews talk about, talk about these, uh, these uh, uh, God coincidences where you look back on something and you know, it's not, and they do that tongue in cheek. You know, it's not a coincidence. You know, somehow <laughs> God engineered this thing. So when Pat was struggling with all of this kind of stuff. And, and I, I'll tell you, I was just, I was just watching this and just thinking, and I was, I just can't even, you know, I hate what she's going through. I hate what's happening in her life. I hate what the people around her are doing to her. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and, and really, you know, I even, after watching my mother 
emotionally because of what was happening in our family, watching my mother just kind of give up. I mean, she just gave up. She went over the edge when all this happened with our family. And, um, and I remember thinking, you know, Pat could go over the edge. She could just, she could just get so worn out with all this that she just gives up on life. I and came so real sorry. close. I came real close. Well, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't even, you know, I don't, I, you know, she, she's my she's my last living relative and i don't even know how long she's going to be here and so i remember i made this decision one day i said you know something you know pat has she's making this heart journey and and i, I said i talked to brenda one day i said you know something i don't even know how long pat's gonna be alive mm. and if something don't change she won't be alive long i said so so you know i've thought about what can i do that would make sure that what, however many years she lives, mm -hmm. what can I do that would, would help make these like, the very best years of her life? And, and so Brenda and I, you know, we, we talked about it. And so I said, you know something? She's got a passion to minister to people. I think, she's got, I think she's got a destiny to minister to people. And I said, you know, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm, I'm going to bring her on as a heart physics coach. And I said, you know, it's, it's scary. Yeah, I, thought, I thought that was an accident. <laughs> no, I'm an accident. I don't do nothing by accident. Even her daughter called me and she said, I appreciate you doing this, but you know it's going to probably end bad. And I said, well, you know, no. I said, it might end bad. I said, but this wow. is all I can do right now to yes. I know of that will facilitate her being able to do what she want to do with her life. I said, you know, I can't make it for her. If she, if she does it and succeeds, then that's, that's her and God working. I'll, you know, I'll mm -hmm. be an encourager. And I said, but if she doesn't, I can't do anything about that either. I said, but it, it, I said, and it could end bad. You know, if, if we fall back into our old patterns, yeah, it, this could end real bad, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, besides the fact that she's served people, helped people, been a benefit to people, I think that with, I think that the God coincidence in this is she gave to me in those years when I couldn't, and that kept her bond to, to me alive. And for me, when I was able to, to provide an opportunity for her, you know, I didn't give her something she didn't deserve. I didn't give her something she didn't work toward. I didn't give her something she was unqualified to do. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, you know, to take that chance and say, okay, listen, I, I'm going to do this. Because giving my giving from that perspective, it, it did something in my heart that made me bond. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm saying to everybody is, you know what? Number one, just get whole yourself. And, and whether that other person gets whole or not, the more whole you get, the more you're going to be able to walk in love and kindness toward them. But also, the more you give to that other person's life, not in a codependent way. So I would not, Pat knows me, it wouldn't matter. I would not have let her done this if she had not stepped up, if she wouldn't do it. I'm not going to do for somebody what they're unwilling to do for themselves because that hurts them worse than anything you could ever do. And I wouldn't have done it. I was not going to. I would not facilitate codependency. I w absolutely would not let somebody minister to the people that I feel responsible for if I couldn't trust them and didn't feel like they did a good job. So this wasn't like, this wasn't like me just giving her a pass. <laughs> but uh, and so I'm not talking about doing this codependent enabling stuff. I'm talking about you give to people where you can. Mm -hmm. You give to people what you can, and and sometimes, not sometimes, all the time. Yes, that will that will recreate a bond that counseling can't fix, that talking through your problems can't fix, that rehashing the past can't fix. You just get a hold and try to give that other person. You know, and and honestly, you know, Pat has spent her life try, always trying. You know, when I was a kid, and and you know when we didn't get allowances and we, you know, we would be without anything to eat. You know, I, I could go to where she worked and she'd buy me a hamburger. I mean, she all, she was always good to me. Mm. And so, so, you know, you give what you can yes. out of whatever wholeness you have, not trying to get something back. Yes. You know, 
And, and for Pat, I think Pat, Pat you tell me if I'm wrong, just, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm hearing parts of this for the first time. You know, when she stopped pursuing our connection for the benefit of what she would get back, mm. then that's something big, changed in her. That's a big point. Yeah. So, you know, just get whole, walk in love, give what you can give to other people, and you'll be yes. amazed yes. at the bond that can, that can come back. Yes. yes. Pat, before we close it, would you like to say something? I, you know, I just, I appreciate uh, everything. <laughs> you know, I did, I did give to Jim a lot. I, I remember he used to talk to me all the time about having a worldwide ministry. And I, I always said, and I'd have to give him gas money to get him out of town. <laughs> 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 you, know, you know, but, but it was just, yes. You know, what my heart wanted to do, my heart always wanted to do that. And, and it really, right. you know, really it was not uh, to gain or to, no. you know, to have him be anything to me. It's just, that's, that's what I wanted to do. That's just always what I wanted to do. And uh, I so appreciate uh, the fact, that, like I said, I always thought me becoming a heart physics coach. As a matter of fact, I told Abby earlier that, that that was just an accident. <laughs> it <was> an accident <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No surprise. Uh -huh. But it's, I, I've known during, while I've been doing this heart physics coaching, I've known that my entire life, yes, everything, my entire life has led up to this. Oh. And, uh, and it just, it amazes me uh, that I'm here, <laughs> that I'm, that we're here, that you and I are able to do this together. It's just one of the greatest blessings of my life that we can do this together. Absolutely. You know, I always, uh, when I first got saved, I found the scripture about older women teaching younger women how to love their husbands and how to be godly. And uh, nobody, no older woman had stepped into my life and taught me those things. And I said, at that time, I was in my very early 20s, and I said, God, I don't know anything. I, I don't know anything. I don't have anything to teach anybody. But when I get to be an older woman, I want to be able to teach mm -hmm. how to be godly. Yeah. And, and I think that God has, uh, through this, God's made that happen. He's yes. had a possibility. So, so what, what we're going to do is when we go off of this, she's going to have a private counseling session with you. Can I get you straightened out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I doubt that. But... <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> yes, I appreciate Abby for doing yes. this. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, for us to just come together like this. Yes. And and mm -hmm. all these things that you know what Abby is doing is the fulfillment of my biggest dream. My the fulfillment of my biggest dream is that I can invest in people yeah. who, out of their own heart, they make it their own. You know, they're not just repeating something they're hearing me or somebody else, but they it comes alive inside them and they multiply it to people I'll never reach, but, you know, don't have the time to reach, won't live enough lifetimes to reach, don't have the financial resources. And really, you know, all I want the rest of my life, I've wanted this, I mean, you know, I've been making this journey ever since we, you know, that's why we had a Bible school. That's why we did all the things that we did is to uh, the multiplication factor. And, uh, you know, my ultimate dream for the rest of my life is that people like Abby will step up and, and do what they have a heart to do. You know, I'll equip, I'll train, I'll provide resources, and they're the ones that have got to go because, you know, I'm almost 70, and I tell you, God is, you know, God is just put it in my heart. It's like, you know, your days of going are over, and every, every, from, from the rest of your life, it's about investing in the younger people that, that are ready to go. Amen. Amen. This is amazing. This is such a blessing, and I want to tell you, all over the world, and I hope this is not just one session. I hope we're going to repeat and we're going to continue. Okay. So I thank you so much. I think we're going to say, uh, we're going to close it for now. I That's love you guys. An hour and a half right now. Yes. 
Thank you, Abby. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Live in freedom. Remember, take notes, re-watch this again, whoever you are, whatever your situation is. Remember every word that Pat says and Dr. Jim. There is hope for you, know, regardless what you live in. We all have been in some sort of moment of our pains, hopelessness, right? But remember, you don't have to stay in hopelessness. You can move on. So thank you so much. Join us again. Amen. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.